Hi there, good evening everybody. I can see our numbers going up. We've got lots of people joining this evening. We've had almost record numbers of registrations for this webinar this evening. So um, obviously a very popular topic, no pressure, David. So good evening to you if you're just joining. I can see the numbers still going up pretty rapidly. So we will just hang on for a minute or two before we make a start. Good evening to you if you've just joined. We're just waiting for a minute. The numbers are still going up, but it looks like they're slowing down just a little bit. OK, I think we will make a start. So good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining this evening's webinar from Veterinary Instrumentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Rachel Beecham. Uh, I'm the training manager at VI. And I think um, by the look of the registrations, we've got a really good mix tonight of people who've attended a VI webinar before. And I think there's also quite a lot of you who are first timers. So um, welcome to everybody. So before we start tonight's presentation, I'd just like to highlight a few bits for how the evening's going to work. Um, there are going to be some interactive questions throughout the webinar um, to, to keep you guys engaged and to keep you thinking, but also to help us uh, understand our audience a little bit better as well. Um, those interactive questions do work best if you're on a desktop rather than a mobile. So if you've got the choice, um, you might choose to, to move across to your laptop. Um, full functionality of those might not be available uh, on a mobile phone. Um, David and I were having a, a, a chat just a minute about, ago about uh, Q&A. Um, questions absolutely encouraged and very, very welcome. Um, the Q&A function is open, so please do post your questions as we go along. Um, both David and myself will be keeping an eye on the Q&A as we go. Um, if David sees something pop up, um, that needs addressing, then um, he'll address that as he goes along. Otherwise, we will have time uh, for Q&A at the end. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. The recording link will be sent out to you um, via email uh, in a day or two's time. And everyone who's here live this evening will be uh, receiving an attendance certificate. So um, tonight's webinar, as we can see from the screen, is um, uh, an introduction to ophthalmic surgery in general practice. And I'm absolutely uh, delighted to welcome our speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. David Williams. I don't know if David remembers, but very many, many moons ago when I was a trainee vet nurse um, working near Cambridge, um, he used to come to the practice where I was, um, where I was training to be a vet nurse. And I, was, I watched his ophthalmic surgeries in uh, in awe, not only of his skill, but also of his bow ties. So um, it, it is genuinely an absolute pleasure to have David with us this evening. Um, David qualified as a vet from the University of Cambridge in 1988, and he knew even at that stage that he wanted to devote his professional life to veterinary ophthalmology. He undertook his initial clinical training at the Animal Health Trust under Dr. Keith Barnett, and then moved to the Royal Veterinary College for a PhD before returning to Cambridge, where he runs the ophthalmology clinic. He visits numerous clinics providing an ambulatory ophthalmology referral service, so he's used to performing ophthalmic surgery in that referral environment, but he's also got a really good understanding of the challenges and the opportunities facing vets in general practice who are keen to do their own ophthalmic surgery. So I think this webinar is going to I've had a sneak preview. I think we're gonna get a really, really good overview of the topic. Um, so David, I'm gonna hand over to you, take it away. Thanks very much indeed, Rachel. Yeah, the lovely thing is that, so so as I say, I work at the vet school, but then I, I work um, for, I don't know, probably 
30 different veterinary practices going around. Some of them, I don't know, maybe you're, you're, you're that. Um, so I zip around the, 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 the East Anglia, basically. And so lots of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, well, all, basically all of the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight can be done just in your, in your own practice. So you know, one of the troubles with ophthalmology is that um, if you build yourself a 15 million pound hospital, you'll want to make vets feel uncomfortable with eyes, so they have to refer things on to you. Well, um, I, I've only got a car to um, uh, to, to to zip around uh, um, to, to 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 need to keep my my prices up. So I'm pleased to say that I think the vast majority of stuff that we'll be talking about tonight can be done by you in in general practice. You know, about what about you know, 30 years ago, vets were were on for doing anything, having a go. And I mean, I, I understand why now it's good that uh, there are specialists and so so people in general practice don't feel quite as as uh, as uh, as able maybe to um to do things. But I think it's really good. There will be people who for that financial and geographic reasons can't be referred. And so I think it's really good if you can if you can have a go uh, with some of the stuff that we'll be we'll be talking about um tonight. So so let me start off by saying the sort of things particularly that we will be talking about are adnexal disease, entropians, diamond eyes, cherry eyes, uh, and extra hairs, things like things like that that we'll certainly be we'll certainly uh, discuss. And then also things like corneal ulcers. There are there are vets in in referral places. Oh, really, really, these are the sort of things that should be referred on because they can go horribly wrong. Well, sometimes there just isn't the opportunity to um to um to refer on. And as I say, it's quite possible to um uh to, to operate on some of these these cases um, without um uh you know, uh without the, the the intricacies of a of a referral practice and some of them you're just going to need to to deal with immediately as an emergency rather than refer on there are other things that we see on the right hand side there lens luxations and and cataracts that probably do need um more of a, a of a, a, a uh, a situation where you've got a, an operating microscope and things like that. But actually, then you need to know what are the right ones to refer in the right situation. So we'll talk a little bit about that right at the right at the end of the of the session. But first of all, we need to talk about some instruments that you would be you would be using. And I think the key thing about about ophthalmology there, everything is pretty small. So um, something like the the little Calibri forceps you see there, and right on the um, on the uh, um, on the left hand side, you can see a, a, a close up of the of those. They're tiny, and that means that they're able to use be used in really delicate tissues. But the key thing is, a, a really important factor is once you've held that tissue with those forceps, you've put an enormous amount of pressure on the tiny ends there. So don't move around the tissue. If you're gonna hold a cornea to say, do something on an ulcer, use one position where you hold it and don't move around or you'll be traumatizing the eyes. Similarly with, with, the, um, uh, with, with, with eyelids, hold them in one position and then just move with that going on. Then things like um, um, suture, we'll talk a bit more about suture later, but really good to be, have a small pair of so like Castrovirio um, needle holders there. And then as far as um, blades are concerned, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about blades, but there are lots of opportunities for, for uh, disposable blades if you're going to go into corneal surgery or something like that. But maybe that's something for a, for a, future, a future webinar or something a bit more uh, um, a, a bit more specialized from that perspective. So the key thing is, and I think the other thing is, when you've got your instruments, um, just keep them for, uh, for ophthalmology. So here, here are these Calibri forceps. So you remember, who was Calibri? Well, actually, Calibri is the Latin term for a hummingbird. I love that. In fact, and that hummingbird is so delicate it goes into the flower. And so similarly with these, you can either get ones with rats at the end or, or blunt-ended calibis, but really useful, just putting a small amount of pressure on the eye and moving that tissue, tissue around. And then um, uh, 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 
scissor-wise, uh, Raymond Castrejo was a really important a Spanish ophthalmologist at the turn of the, the last century. And, um, uh, and then with the Spanish Civil War actually moved to Mexico, but he developed so many instruments, the Castrejo needle holders and these, these, four, these, these, uh, these scissors. And one thing I think about the scissors is, and use them, sure, for cutting, but also so much, as we'll see in a moment or two, for blunt dissection across, across tissues. Because if you can get the right tissue cleavage plane, then that really can be very helpful. So again, tremendous little, little, little devices, uh, these, really, really useful to have. And that means that when you're looking at tissues to cut, you need to be thinking about what's going on in the anatomy and the microanatomy of the tissue. So if you've got on the right hand side conjunctive that you're cutting, you've got epithelium at the top. Uh, Rachel, will my, if I put the, the um, my, 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 well, I was going to say if I put my, my, um, uh, my pointer on there, but I don't think that it actually seems to work on the slides. So you can see there on the top right, uh, you've got the epithelium there, and then underneath the epithelium are lots and lots of layers of the substantia propria. So what you need to do, if you're going to make something like a conjunctival flap, is cut to the level that you're that you're aiming to to get to, and then bluntly dissect across. So you're not making lots of little snips that gives you an irregular thickness of conjunctival. Once you've got to the level you think, and I should, that's where I think the cleavage forceps are really useful. If you've got a bit of conjunctiva grabbed with your cleavage forceps, and then you make an incision, you know that's about probably 250 microns that you're holding there, you're just able to hold, and then undermine it with the scissors, and that gives you a beautiful single layer of, of flap that you can get, you can get across. Similarly, with the, with the cornea, and um, you can either use, we've got on the on the left hand side there, a, a crass crescent knife uh, to cut through the layers of the of the collagen fibrils. And once you've got to the depth you need of collagen fibrils, then just bluntly dissect over either with a crescent knife. The crescent knife has its cutting edge at the top, so you never go further down. Or you could just use a pair of scissors and and and, and undermine through as we're doing in a in this situation here, I had left my uh, my kit in that middle that middle picture. I had left my kit uh, back at a previous practice, so all I had was a small pair of normal uh, Stephen Snotby scissors. Oh gosh, um, how can I do this? But actually, it worked perfectly well. So it's a question of uh, having what you've what you've got. All of, all of course, buy a couple of sets of equipment for veterinary instrumentation. So you've always got one spare if you lose yours at some point. Really. Um, so um, Rachel, I'm glad, you'll be glad to know I'm going to be pushing people to buy more and more and more of your, your stuff. So it's really good how veterinary instrumentation and I years and years ago came up with a reasonably decent set of instruments. We'll talk about this in a moment or two, that basically do everything you need to um, in um, uh, uh, with the with regard to to the sort of stuff that we we'll, the adnexal surgery we'll be talking about today. So back to blades. You'll in the in the veterinary instrumentation kit. There's a beaver blade, which is the the blade that you'll see on the on the right hand side there. And some people say, "Oh, can't I just use a Bob Parker?" Well, the lovely thing about the beaver blade is it's so small and it's got such a fine handle that actually the blade becomes part of the end of your finger and is much e more easy to 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 manipulate than a larger blade. I mean, if you if you haven't got the smaller blade, it's not the end of the word. You can certainly with a number fifty. 15 blade, actually this is a large blade, but the 15 blade you can use, you can do the majority of stuff, but the beaver blade really allows you to be a bit more delicate in your in your cutting. And then of course, yeah, so the needle holders, I mean again, you can use whatever needle holders you like, but I mean there are some uh, 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 the, the, that aren't Calibri's, but I find that the Calibri's, the, the sorry, the, the Castroviejo are really useful. And you can see this one that we've got, that I've put up there, has a little uh, clicker that allows you to, to then hold the needle in place without having to push, put pressure on the, on the handles. I think that can be a, that can be a really useful thing when you're, when you're being very delicate in where you're putting your, your needle. 
And then of course, what needle to have? Well, generally we'd say that the reverse cutting is the, is the thing to do. And I would say a three fifths curve is the sensible one to, to have. Um, uh, swaged on from uh, uh, yeah, ethylon generally, but 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 I think that's a really useful way of of having having those. And six nor is ideal for um, for um, for the, all the, most of the surgery we do. Obviously, um, nowadays you go to a, if you if you refer to something for say corneal surgery to uh, to a referral practice, they probably recommend they would use eight naught. Well. When I started as a veterinary ophthalmologist in 1988, we didn't have 8-0, we just had 6 naught, and we did everything with 6 naught, and we didn't have operating microscopes, we just had an all loop. So it's certainly still possible to do everything you need to that way. It's just that if you want to make it seem that people have to refer to you, it's much nicer to have uh, 8 naught and or even 10 naught. And, a, and an operating microscope, but really um, um, a six naught vital with a reverse cutting uh, three fifths curve needle should do you for everything that you need to we need to do. Okay. And then, so I love using Vitral because I like a suture that's really malleable and really is easy. When I when I, when I go and say use PDS, it's a the, the surgeons would like to use it because there's less of a wicking effect of bacteria with the um, with with a, with a, with, a, with a monofilament. But I find the monofilament is so much more difficult to deal with. And also, when it uh, um, the the Vicryl, um, uh, uh what's the word um, um, uh, degrades. Okay, you can see there under an electron microscope, it looks horrible. The degrading Vicryl, but actually. It degrades really nicely in the cornea or the lid, whereas actually the monocryl ends up often snapping and then causing a problem. So that's why I always go for the six or, or maybe maybe if you've got if you've got if you've got some decent loops, you can still use use eight nor uh, vital, and that's what I go for for the vast vast majority of the of the um, uh, the surgery that I do uh, in in the eye. And then, of course, it's what do you do with your kit? If you bought a whole load of these small, delicate instruments, the last thing you want to do is bung them uh, um, uh, on, as we've got on the, on the left hand side, all there together in a bag, all jiggling around and banging against each other. So much better to have a, an instrument case. And of course, the veterinary instrumentation instruments all come in their own, their own case. And then you can sterilize that. But what I'd say also is, if you're doing surgery, this may be true for any surgery, you know, but certainly with ophthalmic surgery, where you don't want to be scrubbing dried blood off the end of your instruments. Actually, if you have some sterile water in a pot next to you and you put the instruments in the pot as you've used them, then that means you can take them out again and um, if, if you need to reuse them. But that means that the, the and then there's going to be no congealed dried blood on there because that can be really useful in these other things, these very delicate instruments. You don't want to be scrubbing them to try and get um, to try and get that detritus off. So, so, so that's just some little suggestions with regard to instruments. And then, as I say, we've got the uh, the the ophthalmic kit from veterinary instrumentation. The the Castroviejo needle holders and scissors, the Stevens sultry scissors, the Calibri. Uh, um, uh, uh, forceps. Um, there's some gray fixation forceps. Um, well, I, I have to say, I, I mean, that seemed good when we set it up. And the Roberts tying forceps. I think you can get away with um, with those. With um, probably the gray fixation forceps are useful if you're dealing with 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 eyelids. Um, and but the, I, I don't really think you probably need a Robert Stein forceps in there, and um, just some um, some some normal forceps would be fine. And then the Sparica speculum, so the little wire speculum, is really really useful because a bigger speculum you can get. You know the ones that you turn the the edge and they open up. They're 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 very nice, but actually the Sparica is really really light, and I like something that isn't moving around a lot as I'm doing the surgery. So so that's why we've got a Sparica in there and then some archery forceps in there the beaver blade and then as i say the the instrument box with the silicon insert you can just 
always always have them there too uh, and you know exactly where you, where they are when you've got that and um, so I, i'd recommend those if you haven't if you haven't got a, a set or already and then of course is preparing the the animal so i don't know i hope you've got a small pair of of um uh, uh of uh, clippers but they can be really really useful to um um uh, to clip with and then and then what i would do these days i get one of those little um 250 mil i suppose they are um, uh, uh, bags of, of saline and i put in the relevant amount of povidone uh, to be 0.5 percent or point uh, or 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 0.05 percent, 0.1 percent, um, uh, to to get you, the, and then you've just always got it there to to just um, draw out and um, and uh, to to sterilize your your surface before you uh, before you operate. So so just just some little things again on how to prepare the the patient. So let's uh, before you all go to sleep, let's have a little little question here. What's the problem here? Is it entropian? Is it actually Horner's syndrome? Maybe there's a uveitis there. Ooh, might there be a foreign body somewhere there? Or maybe actually it's, uh, it's fine and there's nothing wrong with it at all. So the interactive questions popped up on your screens. Yeah. Um, can see the numbers going up, which is great. That's about a third of our audience of given an answer. David and I can see the spread of the answers as they're coming in at the minute. I don't think the audience can, but we will share that spread of answers with you um, in a minute. That's that's about half of the audience who've submitted an answer. So we'll just leave that up for another 15 or 20 seconds. Give you the chance to have a look at the picture, have a think about that. Okay, that's okay. about two thirds of our audience who've submitted an answer. So we'll end okay. that poll now. And then if I share the results, David, the audience. Yeah, that sounds, sounds great. Yeah, good stuff. This is great. So, so of course, I mean, sensibly, you know that we're going to, we, because we're doing our next surgery. I So entropian might, is, like, is, is the right answer. Um, you can see, the thing is, you can see on that lower lid, well, the thing is you can't see the edge of the lower lid, which is what tells you it's entropian. Or I, can you guys see the, 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 my, my pointer as it's moving around? Can they see it, Rachel? I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, but that lower lid, you can't see a nice hair-free edge thing. So you know that's going to be entropian there and some, some hairs rubbing on the eye because because the eyelid has, has turned in so but actually i put horner syndrome in there because what are the signs of horner syndrome a small pupil an elevated third eyelid and an uh, a, a, a smaller palpebral aperture so actually this has got the signs of horner syndrome um because and i think that's interesting to say something that's irritating the eye can look like Horner's syndrome so so that um, you can see the third eyelid's up because the eye is irritated and so the eye is pulling itself back and um, and so that's why the the third eyelid's up and maybe i mean maybe it's just the the, the pupil's small because we've got a bloody great light shining on its eye but uh, but uh, so so always thinking about so the the thing of course is if you put in a drop of phenylephrine into this eye well at some point the people would probably dilate but the third eyelid would certainly not go down and you wouldn't say change anything with regard to the palpebral aperture because what's happening there is that you've got an interning of the eye this is a young cocker spaniel so so and um, so you've got uh, an interning of the lower eyelid and that interning is then causing some irritation, which is then as I say, pulling the eye back a bit and pulling the third eyelid up. 
And that's a problem, isn't it? Because if we want to know how much to take off that, as we'll talk about in a moment or two, we're going to need to, to, to see how much of the interning is anatomical and how much is, as we might say, spastic, is actually reactive to the hairs rubbing on the eye. So what I'd say, how do we work out the difference between the two there? And I think the way to the way to look at that is because if you if you put a drop of local anesthetic in there, hopefully you'll relieve the discomfort there. But actually, you won't still relieve the, the injury. When you come to cut this, what I would say is if you drew a little picture, if you pull with your thumbs, if you pull down the those that lower limb, you can see how much you have to pull down. And then you can make a little picture of say maybe maybe that's half a centimeter's worth of, of skin along the, that you're gonna have to have to take off there. And at that point, I mean I'd always say take off less rather than more. Um, but also the other thing is once that animal is anesthetized, then the irritation all goes completely and you'll then be able to see better how much to take off. And that's a take off less rather than more there. Oh, other things, uveitis, well again, a small pupil could give you uveitis there, yeah, couldn't it? A foreign body, yeah, there might be a foreign body there, which is causing blepharospasm and interning. So it's always worth checking for these things. And yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, some of you said nothing. I mean, I think probably there is there is something going on there, but as I say, it might just be a foreign body, foreign body there on that, on that score. So, so let's just Dave, David, just David, just, just right. to interrupt, I yes. could see I could see your pointer. Oh, could so you? Okay, I'm so. assuming that the audience oh, yeah, can as well. Yeah. That's okay. Good stuff. That's lovely. Okay. So oh I just can I can I just come off that pole then? Because somebody has said, and um, it would be nice if you could. Ooh. Oh yeah. So if, Nice to fix the cursor. So can you guys see to see the cursor now? So you can see I'm just oh yeah, that, 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 that's good. Yeah. So all that bit along there is if you can tell that's entropian there because the you can't see a nice clear edge to the eyelid. I think the consensus oh. is that we can see your point. Yeah, it just yeah, wasn't I, very clear against I'm the just, image. Now, the thing is, I'm now. Oh, wait, wait. so what we need to do is in that situation. Remember, we've now pulled down the lid to see how much we need to do. We've maybe even maybe did a little, done a little drawing to see how much. And is it the whole length of the lid? If I go back, actually, you might say medially. He, uh, here, there seems to be a bit more interning than than laterally. So maybe when we do our cut here, as I'll show you here, we're we're going to make our first first incision really quite close to the lid to, to the to the lid edge. Maybe a little more than half a centimeter, but no more than that away from the lid. All you need at that lid edge is enough skin. To be able to put your your needle through there, oh, pardon me. Um, so 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 really a very short distance from the edge of the lid, and then that means that when you decide how much to take off, if you had gone double that distance from the edge of the lid, then when you took off your little ellipse of skin, then that's the skin that you've got left right at the lid edge would it would widen and you'd be much more difficult to work out exactly how much to, to remove. So remove the a little ellipse of skin. I mean honestly if you can do a cat's bay you can certainly do an entropia. It's so much easier two incisions cut a bit of skin off and then sew it up. Honestly now again there are people who would sew up with simple interrupted sutures. I think that just gives you too much uh, um, suture material in the lid and starts irritating. So I must admit, I do a simple continuous from one side to the other. The trouble with that is, of course, you if you're not opposing direct bit to direct bit, you can end up with a dog ear at the end after the surgery. The last thing you need in a dog eye is a dog ear. So 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 make sure maybe even put one single suture in the middle. Um, uh, in the middle there, 
to make sure that you're opposing the two edges perfectly and then do a simple continuous along there and that really works works very well to my mind um better than individual sutures and also it's a far far quicker than after you do all these little knots so so I, that's that's a little tip that i would say from that perspective and also again do less rather than more. I always say to the people, um, I'm going to take, if I'm going to take more or less, I'd prefer to take less off. So then we might have to do another surgery. And then of course, if you've said we might have to do another surgery, I'm hoping not, but we'd prefer to take less rather than more to avoid an outturning of the lid. Then once you haven't got to do another surgery, well, you're amazing, aren't you? Because you, you warned them you might have to, but actually, your surgical technique is, is exemplary, so you haven't had to. So, but if you do have to do another one, you've already covered yourself if that's the case. So just a thought. Oh, so here, here we have a situation where this is an older Cocker Spaniel. The young, first one was a really young Cocker Spaniel. Most entropians in dogs are, are old, are uh, young animals, where there's a, an inherited predisposition to that as a problem. Whereas here, you've got an older Cocker Spaniel. In an older Cocker Spaniel, everything starts to sag. And, and so the upper eyelid is sagging and turning in. And then look at those hairs along the top there. So what happens is that you've got, you've got these, um, these, oh, um, uh, these, these uh, hairs um, along, um, along there. Um, that are rubbing on the eye and causing a huge problem in these in these animals. So um, so uh, I would so so there you have to do what's called a Stardis procedure, which is where we cut right at the edge of the lid. So I've shown you the, the picture here. Let me just check. Oh, thank you, Jeff. So what I would say is I would use Vicoli. I wouldn't use a, a non-absorbable because like you're wanting to be able to to um, uh, to 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 have that without having to remove those sutures. So I'd always use Vicryl on the skin. I know that some of the surgeons will be throwing their hands up in horror saying, I shouldn't be using a, 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 a polyfilament um, in the skin. But honestly, I've never had a problem with in, in, in dwelling a bacteria that they say can come along your um, your uh, braided filament. It always seems fine. It's so much easier to use um, in the skin, Vicryl, than PDS or something like that. So I'd always, I'd always go for Vicryl. So thank you for that question, Jeff. So what you can see here then on the right, it's so difficult to get good pictures intraoperatively that mean anything. So what we do in the start this was you. I do this. I'm. I do this. A couple of times, and once every couple of weeks, probably. Um, and the, these all lots. The next time you look at an old cocker spaniel, so many of them look a bit uncomfortable. Imagine having all those hairs rubbing on your eye all the time. So we make an incision in nearer the eyelid edge uh, than the, the, the hairs. So actually closer into the eyelid edge than you would in if you were doing a normal hot Celsius procedure for entropion, where you say you're going half a centimetre away. So here you're going really, really close to the eyelid margin and then make a big, um, a, 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 um, a, a big arc here. So, let me see. So, so we've gone really close inside the edge of the, of the, of the lashes and then a big uh, arc over here so that when we sew this down again, I'm not going to sew all of that together. I'm just sewing it. And here I've got some simple interrupteds. I could have done it with a simple continuous, but but I um but I what I wanted to do is leave a gap of hairless or of of hairless of subcutis basically there. It looks horrendous immediately after the surgery. I mean, you have to warn the people, but the animal will be so much more comfortable. You can see there the third eyelid coming up in this dog because it's so uncomfortable with all those hairs rubbing. Then, the moment you've done the surgery, come on, computer. Oh, why are you not over there? The moment you've done the surgery, A, you've changed the colour of the dog's skin. That's not something I do on a regular basis. But, but, so, but here, just a picture, another picture from another dog. Sorry, I couldn't find the picture from that dog. But you can see here now, it looks just horrendous because you've got this big pink 
a strip of, of subcutis. In a week or so, that will have all granulated up. And this is a granulation tension technique here, so that the you're left with a dog with lovely, a lovely hairless edge to its upper right and in so 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 much more comfort than it was when it had all those hairs hairs rubbing on it so so honestly the next cocker spaniels we what i have to say is we used to do a surgery called a ritidectomy where you picked up a huge wadge of skin uh, up here took it all out and pulled it up and it looked honestly as if you had stuck something up the other end of the dog and um, uh, its eyes were like well were wide open like that and actually in another six months everything had sagged down again and the hairs rubbing on it so Franz Stardis came up with this idea of actually taking the hairs that are causing the problem out leaving that gap of skin and then a beautiful eye but somebody I'm very bad at taking pictures uh, uh, the long you know, uh, two months after surgery, the people generally, if they're happy with the dog, they uh, they don't come back. So I haven't really got any good pictures of of um, of this uh, this technique once you've finished it. But it works absolutely perfectly. Really, really, really worth worth doing. So here are these diamond eyes. This is a cumber spaniel, ah, and we have real problems with these. I mean. That's one of the issues, one of the reasons that give me a job, but also one of the challenges is that we've developed eyes that are just not fit for purpose, really. So here we've got we've got a, a potential ectropion at the top and the bottom of the dam, and then entropion on the inside. There was a very complicated technique called the Wyman lateral canthoplasty, where you took strips of muscle and move them all about. Do you know, all you need to do here is a little hot cell substance procedure, a little strip of skin taken away from, from this point. This is really the point that's causing the problem, the problem to the animal. You can see there, no hairs, you, so no skin, no clear skin here. There's hairs all along here. But look, up here is actually fine. You can see the clear uh, the clear skin around it. I used to do, I, I remember the first of these I did, and I did um, a, reset, a wedge resection. Uh, come on, Anna, a wedge resection here, and a wedge resection here, and then a little entropian surgery here and here, and made a beautiful oval owl, almond shaped eye. And I was so pleased with what I had done. And a woman came back, the owner came back and said, excuse me, that's not a cumber spaniel anymore. So sometimes you can't win. Really, but I think all you need to do in this situation really is not change the, the diamond, but just make sure that the bits that are in turning then are outturned by your standard little surgery. The human cataract surgeons don't call it, uh, the human ophthalmic surgeons don't call it a hot cell cell. They call it a lateral tarsal strip because you're just taking a little strip of, of, of the tarsus, the, the, the eyelid, off there and to turn it out. And that works. It works very well in such cases. OK, a uh, question for you again. What are you going to do in this pug? Are you going to enucleate it? Uh, maybe, who knows, maybe you enucleate it. But I've got a fair number of pugs. Uh, with bilateral nucleations. Are you going to nucleate it? Or maybe just surface nucleation would be sensible. Would you a lateral canthoplasty? Or maybe a tarsal if you just close the lids for a bit. Or maybe it's time to say goodbye to the um, maybe it's time to say goodbye to the animal. So that question's up on the screen as before me and David can see your answers coming in. That's about 45% of you have submitted an answer. So we'll leave that up there for you for just a little bit longer. Poor dog does not look very happy about life, I have to say. This is Basil, who was owned by, and, I, and his owner has allowed me to, uh, to, to use uh, his name and, and her identity, but used that owned by actually a receptionist at a lovely vet practice. I saw her only last week, actually, uh, near Cambridge. And um, and Basil was, uh, the thing is, she really said she didn't notice that there was a problem, 
And you might say that's crazy, but actually Basil was a delightful, lovely dog that didn't seem to rub his eyes or bother at all. So she, she just thought this was like natural. So, well, we were at 250. I tell you what, um, okay, we'll wait for a minute or two more. That's about that's about two thirds of the yes, audience, David. So let's, so let's say, yeah, share let's those share results them. so that the audience can see the spread of answers there. So actually, um, you're um, uh, in a way, you're lots of you are right. So you're right that the main thing is lateral capillarity. So this is taking a little strip of the skin. Actually, I would do medial and lateral capillarity. So take a strip of skin off the edge of the eyelids here and at the edge there, and then just suture it together. And there are a lot, oh, some of the ophthalmic textbooks have really complicated ways of moving bits of skin around. All you have to do is take a little strip off the top and the bottom eyelid, I would say medial and laterally, and then sew them up uh, with uh, with some 6 knot Vicol, you know, uh, my favourite suture. And look, do that. And as he wakes up, come on, Basil, wake up. Oh. Not the team who want to. Um, anyway, so there's Basil as he woke up from his surgery. And now, those of you who put surface lubrication, absolutely, that every pub needs surface lubrication from day one, as far as I can see. Um, so, um, so, but actually, really, by by closing down the amount of palpebral aperture, that well, let me just go back to show you where he was before. Uh, Oops, oh, sorry. So, oh, where are we? Ah, oh, no. What's? Oh. Are you are you okay, David? No, I'm not. It's now saying if, I don't want to visit some Pinterest page. Return oh. to the previous page. So, no, we, I, I. All can, all we can see is your presentation still. I can't see my presentation at all. All I can see is a thing saying redirect notice. Um, um, hmm. You're definitely still screen sharing. Are you able to minimize that web page? Uh, uh, top, I'm, top can right. I come out of the, can I, uh, um, no, as I say, it's, um, uh, 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 I'm just trying to work out what to do. Um, so it just says the page you were on is trying to send you to a Pinterest.com page, or you can return to the previous page, but I can't it stop working letting me. Um it sounds well, you're definitely still online and we can still see your yeah, presentation. It yeah, sounds like I can't see, I can't see the presentation. So so it's a little bit tricky for me to share it with you. So um uh, so, just to go back to the question for a moment or two, um, the surface lubrication for sure is needed. The tarsography, I don't actually think that, it, because um, you, and I suppose if you're saying a tarsography is, uh, tarsography for me is actually closing and it's completely, but actually from a medial perspective, um, that's, uh, I'm just saying, sorry, you, um, uh, a, um, uh, if you're doing, you're doing, a, uh, a medial lateral tarsography, that's basically what the lateral pamphlet is. I'm just going to have to try and work out how to see, because I now I now can't see my, my page at all. Oh, uh, you see, that's given me a complete, that's not my picture at all. So I don't know what you, what. Mm. I feel slightly oh. helpless to help okay, you. Yeah, so, so I don't quite know what to do here because I'm on a Pinterest page that isn't mine at all. So um, let's see. Uh, it sounds like you've somehow just brought a web page. Ah, I am back again. Are I'm you back? back? Again. Excellent. Right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. Um, we can just cut that out of the recording, can't we? Right. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, so. Um, as I say, uh, this uh, uh, do what we did was to actually close down, as I say, the medial lateral cactus, uh, and and that really did tremendously well for the dog. 
um, and allowed him to blink where he couldn't blink before. And then surface lubrication was, was really, was really, was really, really good to do as well. Okay. Like, lovely. So, on to, um, uh, again, uh, um, uh, to uh, little tumors. And the key thing here is if you've got an animal with an eyelid tumor, do remove it as soon as you can. Here on the left, really easy to remove this with a simple wedge uh, resection. Just and I, I so I don't use a, a scalpel blade to do this. I would just take my Stephen Stoffelby scissors and cut down both sides of that, and then suture it up. Whereas if, once you've got something bigger like the one on the on the left on the right, it's so much more tricky to to be able to actually get those. Um, uh, um, to to get the 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 edges uh, up, uh, opposed correctly. So if you can do it when it's small, fantastic. And there are wonderful techniques of of lid splitting and lid sharing as that. Has. But I think the key thing is if you can just take it out easily, then that's really helpful. So then the key thing is then to be able to to do your suture deal. now. This I picked up from the internet, the, the picture on the top left. I'm not really sure that you need to do this. I don't think you need to suture a lid together in two, uh, in two layers like this. Just seems a bit complicated to me. The one, the figure of eight suture that's rather beautifully uh, drawn uh, there, and I've, I've tried to do on, on the bottom and uh, the, the stages of doing it. So, so the, your your suture, your your needle rather goes in, goes in here and out in the in the in, in the cut surface, in to the cut surface exactly the opposite side, and then and then comes out at the very edge of the uh, top of the lid. And the way to do that is if you've got the lid there, hold it between your finger and four and uh, your and four uh, and thumb like that, and then you can go up directly from the middle and come out right at the top of the of the lid. It's very difficult to draw that, but then, then go back in, oh, bugger, pardon me, get, go back in um, again on the top there, come round out through the cut edge of the lid, into the cut edge of the lid, and then out through the lid edge. And then what's wrong with that? So if you had done that suture, you know, I should have had this as a as a as a as a question. If just think to yourself, if you had done that as a uh, suture uh, um, in a in a live animal, what would you do? And the answer is take it out and start again. Because what you can see here is that um, we've got um, uh, where's my arrow we gone? I'm back. Oh, all well, is forgiven. So I'm just trying to find find the arrow. Oh, there we go. So, so look here, the distance between the cut, uh, the incision edge, and the and where your where your suture comes out is really different from this side. If you had put those two lids together, they would have been like that. They would actually have been a there'd have been a step in them like that because you've got different tensions on the two sides of your incision. So you really ought to take it all out and try again and make sure you've got the same distance between where you're coming out and going in and the and the incision incision. And if you tie it all together and actually there is a, a there is a, a step in it, take it out and, and try again. Because the last thing you want is to do a really nice excision of a tumor and end up with a corneal ulcer because you've got this little step in the in the edge. So just a, that's just a little little tip. There are some wonderful, Gary Lewin is amazing. The guy who got me interested in ophthalmology was a wonderful chap called John Heath in the Six Way Veterinary Group in Solio. When I just went there to do EMS, just because I had some friends close by um, through the church that I could that I could stay with for as long as I needed. And John Heath was an amazing ophthalmologist, just in general practice, who would do all this stuff in his in his normal surgery. And, and the other person who was captivated by ophthalmology through John Heath was Gary Lewin. And Gary um, has come up with some amazing stuff. And here he has a split lid reconstruction. If you have to take a large 
section of your lid out. You then split the lid to, to one side of it into a skin portion and a, and a conjunctiva portion. Move the skin portion over. So you now, you've now, in this point here, this is the picture from this J 2003, I think, JSAP article. And come on, where are you? Um, Ah, oh, there we go. Right. There, we've got the so so then this bit here is skin that you've moved over from the this portion here. And then you've got conjunctiva here. That means that when you then pull over more skin into this area, the hairs on the skin from the medial portion won't won't uh, rub on the on the cornea because there's conjunctiva underneath holding them up. It's a wonderful way to do uh, a, a resection where we're actually if you take more than half of the or half of the lid away, you can't then just do it with a roll. If you take more than a third of the lid away, so if you take more than a third of the lid away, you can't then just do it normally with a with a um um with a with with a wedge wedge resection and a normal figure of eight uh, suture. So 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 that's why Gary Lewin's technique there is absolutely wonderful, really good. I am just trying to raise the questions and answers a bit so I can see them. Sorry, I'm having problems with my points, finding out where my points are. Oh there we go. Let me see what Sarah is asking. Oh yeah. Thank you. Oh Sarah, good question. Um, so, um, so why do you clip? do I always clip the eyelids previous to surgery, prior to surgery? Well, no, if there's, so I didn't with a surgery yesterday. So if there's only a little bit of hair there, then I really, I really don't. And I think some people say that clipping the hair then makes it irritating when the hairs come back here. If you've got a really fuzzy, fluffy dog with lots of hair on the eyelids, do do clip it. But if you've got an animal with relatively little hair on the eyelid edge, then 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 I wouldn't clip. Um so oh Mohammed saying, why do I why do I leave a, the gap? So I didn't quite see, could, could you Mohammed, could you just say what the oh do you mean do you mean the gap in the stardis procedure? Well the reason if that's what you're meaning, the reason for the gap in the stardis procedure is that if you did if you cut it if you suture it right to the edge of the lid then there'd be more hair to rub on there so by leaving a gap uh, that granulates and after a couple of weeks it doesn't look like a like a horrible pink gap anymore it's beautiful skin without hairs and the hairs then don't rub on the eye and you're all sorted so i think i if that i hope that was your your the the question that you had Mohammed. so i've been very lackadaisical in not in not um in not media um uh could oh uh right yeah so so the this was uh, um the uh, the attendee you said about the segment on the on was that the pug can he see he can see a bit he didn't seem to be painful so many, so one of the troubles i should have said earlier one of the troubles with with these with these brachycephalic dogs is that actually they've got very poor corneal sensation that's great for the fact they can't feel the fact that if you hold your eyes open now and don't close them until I tell you to, you'll start to feel suddenly an irritation there. You've got at some point to close your eyes. So, so imagine being a pug that just doesn't close, doesn't blink very often. That poor little pug couldn't blink at all, really. But actually, the fact is, we've got really sensitive cornea, so you have to start blinking by now, something. And so, so because those pugs have got relatively less sensation on their corneas, they don't need need inverted commas to blink, and that's why they get pug. They've got pigment and maybe ulcers. And then, of course, an, an animal that can't feel the ulcer until it's popped. Well, that's why we have corneal ulcer problems in, in brachys phallic. And I'll come on to talk about those in a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah. And so, so yeah. So, uh, so thanks very much. You can't fix it. Broken from birth. Oh, yeah. So many of these animals are broken from birth. Yeah. So you could certainly for lubrication on it but i think with that pug you could you couldn't completely fix it but you could do a lot better than you than you thought 
So, oh, um, so when you're doing a medial canthoplasty, oh, so no, the funny thing about the lateral puncture is it doesn't matter if you block those up, because actually that dog needs as much tears as possible on its ocular surface. So actually, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter um, if if you if you've blocked off its its lacrimal puncti um, while uh, while you're doing the medial the medial canthoplasty because um, uh, um, uh, uh, because you're just giving it more tears. In fact, there is a punctal plug that's used in people. We did try it in dogs to actually plug the, the lacrimal punctum in people with dry eye, and it would work in these little dogs as well. If you actually blocked off their lacrimal puncture to give them more lubrication on the surface of their eye when they're just going to be evaporating all the surface there. And Andrew, I'm sure it's possible to do to watch the re there's a replay again. So yeah, we we could go back certainly to, to the things that I've said there. So I hope that's uh, those have helped. Anyway, sorry I should have been I should have been um watching and then uh Stanley Steph says is it a right Right, left or right eye. Well, the thing is, the this works in in either. If you're talking about the sharing the 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 the, the lids, then actually you can do it from either way. It's easier to do it laterally. Uh, but if you've got a, a lateral uh, tumor that you've got to to resect, you can do it from medially. You could do it from from either way with Gary Loon's great great technique. As I say, I think. 2002-2003 JSAP was that, so really worth having a look at that paper. I tell you what I didn't do was actually I didn't give you my email. So what by the oh, by the end by the end I'll 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 make sure I give you my email and my and my and my and my um uh, and my what number for WhatsApp as well in case you've got questions that you wanted to have. So. On to another, on to another, another question. What, so I have to move the, um, what are you seeing here? Are you seeing trichiasis or dystrichiasis or bilobiasis? I thought, oh, rectopic cilia. I think people are warming up to these questions, David. Those answers are coming in pretty quick. Yeah. So that was nearly half of our audience have submitted an answer. We'll just leave that up. Um, somebody did mention in the Q&A that the question box was blocking the picture, but I believe oh, it is possible. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it's individually set. I believe it is possible for you to move that box around your screen. Yes. So that's about 60% of our audience who've given an answer. We'll just leave that up for another few seconds, David. Oh, yes, yeah, fine. Lovely. So. Sorry, I'm just trying to. Get it. Shall I share those answers? So, yeah, do. That's fine. Yeah, lovely. OK, so you should be able to see the spread of answers on your screen now. So, so this is, if you said dystochiasis, you're right. Um, so dystochiasis um, is where a little hair comes from the um, meibomian gland orifice. And so you get lots of these there. Um, actually, if it was trichiasis, is where it's like the cocker spaniel with its uh, lids dropping down where normal hairs rub on the eye. And then ectopic cilia are where the, the uh, dystochiasis, rather than coming out of the top of the lid like that, actually comes out in the middle. There's a really, the ectopic cilia are really, really painful and can be really, really difficult to, to, to find. So, so this is dystochiasis and lots of people have diff When there's lots of, uh, of ways of treating a condition, you basically know that nothing really works completely. So, so I think we might stop sharing now if that's okay. So, so, um, um, so, so if I go on to, so, so if you've got a few distichial hairs, this is a calasian clamp 
um, which is used in people when you've got an infected vibranium gland. They put this on and then curette out your, your vibranium gland. But here, it's really useful. If you, what I do is I cut a little, a little section of the lid. Uh, come on. Oh, there we go. So I, I would cut a wedge of, of just a, a strip of conjunctiva there, taking out the meibomium gland uh, um, uh, follicles, which are where the, um, uh, which are the meibomium glands, which is where the follicles of the, of the, 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 the um, dystichia are. So I would do that. There are people, this is a, a rather old picture where we, where we tried a, um, uh, um, uh, a, uh, for a cryo, but a, a cryo probe that just came with a little square, a little squirt of of, um, of gas going into there, um, and that worked sort of reasonably well. I must admit, now we've got um, there's a cryo pen. Oh, come on! Sorry, I'm just trying to get this through there. So this, so this is a little cryo pen, and you just place it. You can see really nasty the stickier here, but only a few on the upper lid there and there and there and there. So, so then you just yeah, this this you just press it, and it's got a, a liquid nitrogen uh, um, uh, little cassette in there, and it freezes out really nicely onto there. And then once you've frozen the 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 lid the lid edge you then can pluck them out you see there with our calibri forceps we've plucked out the distichia and then generally they don't grow back again and that seems to work really really nicely and um, there are other people who will actually fry them you can freeze them or you can fry them and um, this with um uh, uh thermocautery um that you just push into the into where the where the um, the the uh, either ectopic cilium or dystocarsis is, and then but I find that this when you do this, it really makes them uh, swell up. There's really quite a lot of inflammation afterwards that I don't like. So I must admit, I don't use this. I would just I would just cut either freeze or if you haven't got the opportunity to freeze, just cut out a little section of the of the meibomium glands that are the, the roots of those of those hairs and then just pluck them out. And that normally works really, really well. I think you have to warn people, even with the best will in the world, you'll get a regrowth of some of some hairs. So the other thing is, dare I say, does it really need it? So if you've got a dog with a corneal ulcer that isn't healing and, and he's got dystichia, don't think, ah, the corneal ulcer is there because of the dystichia. Because you look in the other eye, it's got a completely normal cornea and you'll find it's got dystichia as well. So maybe the dystichia are there stopping the ulcer from healing. So you don't want to do a huge surgery. Say you've got lots of dystichia. You don't want to do a huge surgery where you, you spend ages cutting them all out and either freezing or thawing or, or frying or whatever. And much, much easier maybe to give them a lubricating gel to help that cornea heal. Or maybe, as we'll talk about in a moment or two, to do a third eye flap or a corneal or a contact lens um, to, to protect the ulcer as it's, as it's healing. So but a potential for not doing testicular surgery, just, just there. Um, again, there'll be there. When you put three ophthalmologists in a room, you can expect there to be four different opinions. So, yes, so there will be different people saying different things for this. But I find that as I say, freezing can work. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fry them and, and sometimes just cutting them out can be the best thing, but don't cut on the edge of the lid where the, you can see here. Uh, come on. So it is, you can see here, the, the meibomium gland orifices here. Okay. And so, and so um, uh, what we've done there is, is to, is um, to, um, to, uh, to fry the, uh, the, the, the gland 
of one of these where there's been a been a hair coming out. So so essentially. I just right. wanted so, to David, can I just alert you to some questions in the oh, yeah, QA sure. sorry, sorry, yes, relating absolutely. to that slide? Thank you. Thank you very much, New Rachel. Let's have a look at those. So so um uh um if this is less oh sorry sorry, sorry I haven't I haven't taken I because those are still there. I haven't um I haven't gone down and seen the other ones. Sorry. Ooh, where are they? Yeah, these chows are can be really difficult. And I think I think um there it's a question of taking out more sort of more than you expect to need to 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 take out really. Um, and maybe again doing a star this procedure there where they end up with the the you don't want to to be just sewing the lids together again and there's as much hair as possible so maybe a star this procedure on that top lid to to mean that there's that now a gap where there's no hairs there and just granulation tissue and that really works works well uh to, to do that so there's and no you don't need to suture the wedge um um, so, so with the, my being is no, no, because what you're doing is you're not. It's if you've got the eyelid there, you're not taking a wedge of eyelid out. You're taking a strip of skin on the my being guys, and that heals really, really quickly. That's fine. Oh, so yeah, do you know, interestingly, so the the question about the cryoblast in the cornea. Let's just go back for a moment to uh, where are we? Um. So um, what you see, because you're holding the, um, the, um, uh, the, the lid with these calasian clamps, you can actually keep it off the cornea. So the, the, your own, and because the, the cryo pen has a very, very fine tip to it, um, then you can, just, you can just go across there um, and um, and you're you're very you're just on the on the surface of the of the and because you're going on the conjunctival side actually really unless you have a very thin lid it doesn't cryo all the way all the way through and CO two laser I'm I haven't. It's possible. I mean, I'm sure some of the CO two laser might have done it. I think I would have thought that's a bit too. Uh, maybe a bit too powerful. Uh, so I think probably. Um, uh, I mean, you, I, I, I don't really know. I've never used it myself a CO two laser. I think it may cause too much damage to the eyelid edge because then you're you'd be going as it were down into the into the testicular themselves, and so I think there's a problem. And um, and Claude, I um, I. I don't think that um, that if you if you cryo the mucosa, as you do those, you're not needing to do that for very long. So maybe just enough to freeze it, and then a cold, a, a slow no, what is it? A fast freeze and a slow thaw, which is what the placing cap is giving you. And doing doing that a couple of times is probably quite enough to do that. So I don't don't find any problem with with them um, uh with uh with mucose with them um, with defamation and um yeah i mean you just freeze you, because you've got the scalating camp that's that's keeping the cold in to that area so that's why i think it works out very good so so that's that that's why that's that works out so so and you you sort of um, yeah, it doesn't really granulate. Conjunctiva heals so well; it doesn't really need to granulate. So, so, um, so that's good. Ah, oh, Chris, thank you. For that. So, so, um, Chris says that you've had better, better success with cry and uh, with with cryopenicillin cases. Was that with the cryo pen, Chris? Um, I mean, I think I've been really pleased with with that. And but I think. In all situations, just watch out, just warn the owner. This can be difficult. They can come back either because, well, no, yeah, I don't think it's because you haven't done it su uh, sufficiently, but just because sometimes these just grow. Back. And what I say is, I say, have you ever been, I've never had my legs waxed, okay? But if you go and have your legs waxed, 
the whole point of a beauty salon like that is that your hairs regrow. If they waxed your legs and that was once forever, then you wouldn't find any beauty salons around. But the fact is, the beauty salon waxes your legs knowing that those will come back in, I don't know, I, I, haven't, I, say, I haven't never watched my wax my legs, so I don't know how quickly they do come back. But the same thing with, with this psychiatry is that actually most of the time we're trying to get all those hairs really dead and gone, but they, some will regrow or even new ones will grow in their place. But uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Chris. That's good that um, uh, uh, a cryo gem, okay, yeah, just the same sort of thing as the cryo pen. So it can be really, really, really useful. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks for that, Chris. So good. Oh, yeah. And so, Nick. Yeah, so Nadine has, we've gone on to the next one, which is uh, cherry eye. Yeah, oh yeah. So now I get into trouble with cherry eyes because when I started veterinary medicine, when I started veterinary ophthalmology in 1988, we just chopped these out. And it was only 1991 that Maria Morgan came up with a Morgan pocket technique and in her, which you can see doing on the on the right hand side there, and she presented a set of animals where that had had these removed and had, had got dry up. The trouble is the animals that she removed them were, from were bulldogs and bull terriers and Lata Apsus and Shih Tzus, and actually all those animals get dry eye as well. So I'm going to get in real trouble with this, but if you've got a, a cherry eye and you've replaced it with a pocket technique, I'll talk about doing it in a moment or two, and then it's come out again and you replace it again, what do you do? Well, you probably chop it out. And actually, We've got, I've got loads and loads and loads of cases where the people haven't enough money or are worried about anesthesia and just want to put some local anesthetic in and a clamp uh, across the bottom of the, of, the, of the cherry eye and then chop it out as we always used to do. And I haven't seen a problem with dry eye. Actually, I've seen a problem with dry eye in about three of those tens if not hundreds of cases and I've seen four dry eyes happen in animals where we've replaced them so 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 um yeah um so uh ah you you pay your money and it takes your choice to you but I know a number of practices that do a lot of bulldogs and and just take them out and um and have done I mean I have I have lost one dog under anesthesia while removing one of these and that and that was um in a in a referral institution where the animal just collapsed so so these these things do sometimes sometimes have so oh yeah chris i oh fantastic yeah so so chris says would you consider doing nothing for a cherry eye if it's not bothering patient absolutely so i did you know i've got my so my my um instagram is bowtie b-o-w underscore t-e-y-e if you don't follow that do we have a case today um which is the way to learn ophthalmology and i had an animal there which i put on saying this bulldog doesn't seem to be at all bothered and hasn't been for the last five years. It's got a new owner who says, oh, do I need to do anything? I said, do you know, I really don't think you know, if the dog's not bothered, we should be bothered, which is my mantra for everything, really. And so and some people came back onto the onto the 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 Instagram saying, oh, no, 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 no. these need to be these need to be replaced. Something. So so yeah, if it isn't bothering the dog, uh, you might say, how do you, do you know it's not bothering them? But if the owner says I, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother them and, and they're not rubbing or blinking or squinting, Chris, maybe doing nothing is a, um, is a, is a sensible, uh, is a sensible uh, situation. So Primrose, thank you. Oh, I'd love to see you, Primrose. I will get onto your paper this weekend, honest. Um, do, you, do you have to suture the contract I have closed after after just answer me after what so um i think that was a question from the previous slide david oh i'm sorry let, let me just pick quickly zip back 
oh, uh, um, oh, do you mean, yeah, sorry, do you mean having, having cut your, your uh, mybomium glands out? No, that it naturally beautifully heals in a few days. So yeah, sorry, um, I'm, I'm not very good at trying to talk. I, I, being male, I, can, I can't multitask, can I? So, so uh, no worries, thank you. Um, I'll chat to you later. Um, um, and Primrose is such a wonderful student and she produced a fantastic paper in her research project for her final year and I did not got around to, to getting it published yet. So we will do it, Primrose, honestly. Right, where were we? So cherry eye, so the thing to do for the cherry eye is the, to my mind, the um the uh the replacement if you're gonna do it. So take uh, uh the way I do it is put uh uh uh, either a little hemostat on either end of your of your where am I? Either end of your of your um uh of your of your of your third eyelid, or you could just put a, put a suture in there if you if you're a bit more more delicate than I am, and then make two incisions either side of the of the of the of the cherry. Now the key thing is, don't make your knot on the inside the first three of these i did in 1980 1992 when ria morgan had just published the paper on them i put the suture buried in the inside and all of them the suture came out from being buried and rubbed and caused the corneals so what i do i put the suit i do put my knot on the outside of the third eye push it push the needle through and then i sew the two edges of mucosa together, pushing the, the, the cherry eye together. And then I leave a little gap at the end for the tears to come out. I go back again, doing a second row of, of sutures, go back through and then tie off to the backside. And I think that's probably why I don't get that. I probably get 5% that, that, um, that recur. So, so again, the question is, why, how do I know what to chop out and what to leave? The, the key thing is, if you've got, you we know if you chop that out, you're probably going to lose maybe 20% of your tear production. So if you have uh, this one on the, on the, uh, on the left here, look at the lovely tears as well. You can see a beautiful reflection uh, from, from there. And, and actually, he's going to show them tears of 23 so if i lose 20 percent of that i'm down to like 18 or something like that he's absolutely fine if i've got a bulldog with a shim tear test of 10 ooh, if i remove that cherry eye that third eyelid gland i'm going to uh i'm going to reduce his his share to you know, below 10 and that will not be a happy dog so that's the way i choose well, also, obviously, if I've got someone who says I come to you because I've read the, I've done my research and I want my the the, the gland replaced, fine. But actually, there are loads of people in general practice who can do that quite quite adequately. So so you don't really need to come to me for a, a cherry eye replacement. And if I've got someone through the RSPCA and they've got no money and the RSPCA want to save a bit of money as well, and the and the shemathitis is twenty five, then I'll 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 chop it out. So so um so that's my um that's that's my way of of working out whether what to do in these in these situations. But I could be really told off by uh, um by some of these uh, by 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 ophthalmologists who think that every every cherry I should be replaced. Uh, right now, ooh. Is this a cherry eye? What would you do with a mass in this medial canthus of this 12 year old cat? Chop it out. Enucleate. Fine needle biopsy. So I can see the answers coming in. David, yeah. I'm just going to give you a time check. We're oh. just before 10 to 9. Um, so, audience, we are going to run over our advertised oh, finish time of nine o'clock. I hope that's fine with everybody. Um, it's certainly fine I mean, with me because can I just say, if you, 
if you home. have to go if you have to go at nine remember this will be recorded so you can come back and listen to the next bit up later couldn't couldn't you rachel they could do that yeah Sorry. absolutely the, the the recording link will go out automatically um, on an email within the next 24 to 48 hours. If anyone yeah. doesn't receive that email, um, you've all got my email address already, so you can email me and, and badger me for that recording. Okay, that's link. lovely. So back to this little well, interestingly, um, uh, uh, you could do that. Uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a naughty question, really, because the something else is really the answer, and the reason is that um uh come on uh, the reason is that when you when you when you pull back the third eyelid actually what you can see there yeah it's maybe a bit tricky you can see a band there that then and actually what this what this was was actually a the a curl a scrolled cartilage of of the eye in this cat so then what we end up doing is just if you undermine the cartilage all across and then you can just cut the cartilage out and hey press you can see there on the right and um, the the curliness of the um of the um uh of of that they're pretty unusual in cats, and we actually we actually published this because it was so it was an, an unusual case uh, to see in a cat. But so so just to say that can be the situation in these um, in these for sure um, that uh, that you can get a, a scrolled cartilage, and then there are people who cauterize the cartilage and say that works. I much prefer to actually cut it out, and it's very easy to cut out. Um, undermine it and then you can just keep the third eye in but just chop out that that uh turn scroll with the cartilage um, sorry oh so what's the first key thing to do in treating this ocular trauma replace it in you just take it out, refer it, protect the surface. I mean, guys, it's like preaching to the choir. So, oh, you can't see, of course, what everybody said. We'll leave it for a moment or two more, but we won't. We'll. That's about half, and yeah. I think it's. I think, I think it's, so, a, it, it, it's a. Yeah. So the majority, the key thing, when when your receptionist is rung up by someone saying, oh, my pug's eyes just come out, it's all looked at. So the first thing to do, a rod your cotton wool on there. That hasn't happened in this case. So you can see the, the middle of the corner is really dry there. Um, so so it's going to be a um, so that's the first thing to do. And if you can if you can have it so that the surface is protected and moist then actually it doesn't matter if they take half an hour to get into you. And at that point, then you're going to, you're going to do a lateral canthotomy. Just to take out the lateral canthus, let me show you. So we're going we're to cut the lateral canthus there, and then we're not going to push the eye back in. We're going to lift the lids over the top, and then we're going to put... Uh, on the machine then then we're going to put some little bits of drip tubing push the the suture through the drip tubing and tie it up so that then you can have a decent tension on there without ripping through the eyelid and then after two weeks well it's not ideal is it you know the 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 dog's got a lateral strabismus because its medial canthus is the is the is the is the slow is the um the me, medial um rectus muscle is the shortest muscle so that's been pranged basically and it's got a bit of a corneal ulcer and probably it can't see mm. but don't enucleate it to start with but if we go back then the if you try to enucleate it at the point when it comes, 
you're just going to get horrible amounts of blood all over the place. I mean, just a ghastly situation. So, so protect it, replace it, and then at least also you've given the the guys the 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 opportunity to 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 think about it and maybe enucleate at a later stage if they need to. Don't refer it. Whatever you do, if you refer it, it'll be blind and lose its sight because that needs to be done as soon as you can. So I had a lovely student, Sam, um, and in her first couple of weeks as a as a new graduate um, a few years ago, she she rang me and said, oh, David, I've got this horrendous situation. I said, don't let them refer it because you can do this yourself, I'm sure. And, and actually, the people were said, absolutely not. We're not having a new graduate do this to our dog. We're going to ref refer it. And it took them an hour and a half to get where they needed to be referred. And then, and then the, eye, the eye was just removed. So, so I'd say, and certainly protect the surface and then do a, uh, um, a tarsography, pushing it all the way over. And then hopefully, at the end of the day, you'll have at least an eye retained, if not a, a, a reasonable one. So, so, but we need to say something quickly about enucleation. All the books, almost all the books, say the first thing to do is sew the eyelids together and then cut through the eyelids and then take out the globe. You end up taking out the globe and loads of the of the orbital structures as well. So what I haven't got, this is the best I've got the pictures of this. This is somebody else's from the States. What, what he does first is cut the eyelids first. Don't bother doing that. Keep the eyes open and the eyes open and then just cut around the conjunctiva as you're seeing down on the lower, the lower, um, the, uh, left here. So just cut the conjunctiva all the way around, and then just cut the oh, sorry, cut the lids. Uh, sorry, and then, and then cut the extracular muscles all bit by bit as they attach to the globe. And if you do that, then you won't see a load of bleeding. Look on the on the lower right there. There's hardly any bleeding. Don't try and clamp. The optic nerve you don't need to do that because it's only if you're doing it in a person or a large ape like a gorilla or a chimpanzee then for sure clamp because there's a really great artery the central lateral artery up your optic nerve that you'll bleed out from if someone just took your eye out uh, but actually that doesn't happen in 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 our animals so so once you've taken the eye out put a, a i i would put then uh, a, um, a swab in there and then and then cut the eyelids out. And at that point, once you've cut the, the eyelids out, it can be a bit tricky cutting them out right at the medial capsules, but it, it, it's doable. And then take the swab out. And in the vast majority of cases, there's just a tiny bit of ooze, no more than that. And then, as we've seen done on the on the on the um the, the lower right here. Do, do a pattern of sutures across. Actually, what I do, I keep enough of the conjunctiva that the, the sutures, rather than there being twanged across it, just close those together like a drum over the over the surface. The trouble is, I'm always doing the surgery, so I don't get a chance to get some good good um, um, uh, pictures of the surgery for myself. I should do that uh, uh, a bit more clearly. So, so, so then having removed it or then you can suture those up and okay well they're not ideal but so again these aren't my pictures but 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 if you've left a whole load of tissue in there you haven't got such a sunken in appearance and these animals are fine what am i saying as an ophthalmologist but do they really need an eye lots of these animals are really happy with their noses and their ears and and, and not being bothered by their eyes I will zip this very quickly because I don't really believe in this. So here's a here's a paper on a scleral, uh, a, a corneal prosthesis in this dog that that then um, had its eye removed, and you wouldn't know that it hasn't got an eye there uh, because it's it's they put in uh, an artificial uh, surface there. They've actually rem they've uh, they've closed over the conjunctiva over the surface of the eye and then and then put this artificial uh, 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 corneal surface on there. I mean, I don't believe that. I believe when tomorrow evening our vets graduate, 
there they will say my prime aim will be not to make the owner happy, although we hope they will make the owner happy, but the prime aim will be the welfare of the animals under their care. And so and so um, from that perspective, actually, this isn't doing that because that's really for the owner rather than the animal. So I don't go down that score at all. So, similarly, this is this is Frederick Hobday, um, uh, 1906, his paper, when actually he put artificial glass eyes in, in dogs. And that pug looks good, doesn't it? He, wouldn't, he, he has to say which the artificial eye is um, in, in that animal. But actually, even so, you have to take the eye out every night, wash it, uh, it's for the owner rather than the animal there. So I say, in Newton, is one of my favorite operations. A, it's lovely to have a student assisting me in doing that. And B, it gives you the eye at the end of the day for some pathology afterwards. We had this afternoon with a, with a dog with a, with a cat with a, a, a melanoma. In this. Anyway, so, so, so I would say there are other things you can do. You can put uh, the, the Americans put uh, these, uh, put a, a prosthesis in the eye. Um, I generally, I don't think you need to do that. It causes complications. I would just remove the, remove the eye. What I would say, if you're doing a bird of prey, like an owl, actually removing the eye then really destabilizes. And so, so here is where I would eviscerate the eye, as you can see here, we've, we've cut into it on the on the on the on the left there we've we've opened it up with a pair of a cornea up with a pair of corneal scissors we've then scooped out with one of these uh, um uh, um one of these um uh spears visi spears um uh um a friend of mine calls them britannies as britney spears um but um so scoop out the inside of the eye and then put in some some uh, foam uh, uh, foam cellulite padding and then close it up and that works out perfectly so i would say uh, eviscerate um uh, uh, owls but don't eviscerate dogs it's quick do you mind if we carry on for a bit let's talk about corneal ulcers for me. what would you do in this 15 year old boxer dog would you do topical antibiotics or lubrication? Would you debride the, the ulcer? Would you remove the eyelid tumour? Could the contact lens on enucleate? Big spread of answers coming in. There, and I David. think that's because really there isn't a good answer. If this was a five year old boxer, just Okay, now if this was a five-year-old boxer, would you change what you would do? If it were a five-year-old boxer, I'd certainly remove that eyelid tumor because that eyelid tumor is basically causing, even though it's a boxer, we think of boxers as having having skids, having these long-term ulcers because of uh, because of abnormal adherence of their epithelium. Actually, here the ulcer is probably there because. The of the of that that tumor. So if it was a if it was a dog a five year old boxer, I'd certainly resect that tumor. But actually here, I think probably well, what I did for this dog, I just gave it lubrication and some metacam. Well, the one thing we didn't do, of course, there was put on on pain relief. And one thing I should have said, well, we could have another whole whole seminar on on pain relief in the eyes. So I think in a way, you're all. You're all right to a to a degree there. Um, I, I uh, so so um so that's the issue. But that's the glory of veterinary medicine. It's not just what the textbook says. Each individual case you have to deal with on their own. So so uh, so yeah. So well done. Um, I think you're you've done you've done well on that on that one. Let's zip on then to um to some corneal ulcers. So the key. Three things to ask of every corneal ulcer are, what's the cause? So for instance, the one on the left-hand side there was an animal that traumatized itself uh, uh, going through uh, uh, some, some bushes. The next one along, you can see there, has a little rim of non-adherent uh, uh, epithelium where the, where the, the uh, fluorescence has gone out. That's a uh, classic boxer also a skid where you've got non-adherence to the epithelium so that is so we're going to say what's the cause the cause there is an 
an inner defect of corneal epithelial healing. Who knows what the causes of them? Maybe there's a dry eye on that one, the, 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 the next one to the right, because you've got, but you can see that all the, the, the reflection is all slightly broken up there. So maybe we've got to all, always, before you do anything with the corneal, so before you put some fluorescein on, Put a Sherma tear test on to see whether it's got to, and put it on both eyes because you might find that eye might have a Sherma tear test of 15. But actually, the other eye on the other side of that, I've got a, a Sherma tear test of, of eight because actually now it's got an ulcer there, it's increased its Sherma tear test value a bit. But actually, the key thing is that probably dry eye was what was causing the problem at the, at the beginning. The other question is, so what's the cause? The other question was, is how deep is it? So the one on the left and the next one are really superficial. This one in the, 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 the third one along is sort of half stromal thickness. You can see there the reflection. Where are we? The reflection from the surface there and the flexion in the middle, there's a fair distance between those. But if you can get the lubrication right there, maybe it will, it's trying to, the other question was, is, is it healing? So what's caused it? How deep is it? And is it healing? So this one, the, the, the box real, so isn't healing because it isn't sticking down. This one's trying to heal. It's got blood vessels going to it, but probably it's the it's the dryness that's causing the problem. Sort out the dryness, you probably sort out the ulcer. The one on the far right, of course, is a pug that didn't even know that um that it had an ulcer there until until it it it's popped on this. So, so the, the worrying thing is when people say to me, oh, well, this dog has an ulcer, but it must be getting better because it's clearing in the middle. Well, by clearing, it means you've got a, um, a lower, uh, less stroma there. So you have to do something uh, pretty serious pretty soon about that before it, before it does pop. So we're talking about infected instrumentation, not just corneal ulcers, aren't we? So what are we going to do? So in a scared, like this, you can see uh, this this dog on the, on the left. You can see the the, the layer, uh, the the surface. Um, sorry, you can see the edge of the ulcer, like that around there. And actually, what you need to do here's the devitalized cornea, um, the epithelium here in this histological section, not attaching to this abnormal base of membrane. Here. So what you could do with some local anesthetic and a, um, a needle is just do a grid keratotomy across the whole thing. Or you could do, you could have a little diamond burr and do a diamond burr uh, keratotomy across. And you can see the, the Kaplan Meyer uh, uh, um, uh, uh, graph there. Actually, at the end of the day, after a month, there's not much difference in any statistical difference between the, um, between the, um, uh, the uh, the diamond burr and the and the and the grids. So so the only problem with grids is that everyone's got a got a um, uh, um, a needle. So there's no point sending it to a referral practice. Of course, the other thing is you can buy a diamond burr on on eBay for probably 115 quid. So so that's uh, yeah, so that that works out quite quite nicely. So so we could spend a a lot of time. Um, talking um uh um uh, uh talking about analysis oh let me just answer some questions and um, what's the minimum age you replace a cherry eye mm, th th four three or four months maybe most of them are a bit later than that anyway would you suture the incision in the in presumably that's in the cartilage no you don't need to remove the incision and i think I, I, I think gabapentin is a bit overrated uh, as an analgesic, really. I think I would just use um, uh, um, a metacam in most of these. It doesn't really need much of that. And then, yeah, so, so um, uh, removing the eye, I didn't put anything, no sponge or anything like that in there. Because if you, if you closed over the conjunctival on either side, it's got a little bit drum there, and then close over the skin, over the surface. So you don't need to put anything uh, in sponge or anything. I, the one or two cases I've had for other people who put those in are ones where then it's got infected inside. So I prefer not to put anything in there. 
at all. Um, um, and then, um, uh, yeah, um, the, I mean, it has to be said, talk about the traumatized eyes. I think you can save a fair few of them as long as you do things really quickly. And then on corneal ulcers, yeah, autologous serum can be really useful, or, or even stromies now that we're trying to look at at the moment. But I, I do, what I will talk about in a moment or two is what I would do with a non healing ulcer that's surgical. And then uh, yeah, and then primarily, I find that dogs generally do stand still. If, as long as they've got someone stroking them and making them think of something else uh, to do a grid keratotomy. And the other thing about a grid keratotomy is don't hold the, the needle, if you can see me there, like that. Otherwise, when the dog goes forward, your needle goes into the eye. Not a good thing. If you can hold your needle on the side like that, then if the dog does go forward, it bounces the needle off. But actually these days, I must admit, the diamond burr um, works, um, works really well. Oh, Paul, phenol quarter. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment or two. So, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, good point from Chris about if you've got a, a, um, a dog with one cherry eye, would you wait for a few weeks until... Oh, the trouble is, actually, if you wait for a few weeks, you know, three weeks after you've done it, then another one will go out. So, yeah, trickiness, really. But um, um, so, oh, and then and then Gabriella. Um, um, so uh, the bleeding from mutation, honestly, no, no general need. All you need it to do is for the like, like five minutes or less that it takes you to remove the lids. And honestly, that will be absolutely, absolutely fine. So so that's fine. I have. Nadine, I haven't used place, place, uh, rich, rich plasma, I must admit, in corneal ulcers um, at, the, um, at the moment. Here, what I would say, ironically, we're going on to melting ulcers. So actually, maybe serum is a good idea in here, or maybe, maybe stromies. Um, you could use, or we're doing a little study on that. Sometimes that works well, but other times not quite so well. But what we use, what I really love doing in a melting ulcer, and it works perfectly, and it's really, really, really easy to do, is a hood graft. And so what you do is cut round the, the, the conjunctiva at the top and undermine it until you've got and this, um, um, then you pull it down. This, the, the, the picture I've got there, actually is when we used to do it 360 degrees and sew them together in the middle. Now what I do, I just do the top 180 degrees and I really undermine it, pull it down and suture it to the, to the conjunctiva on the lower, the lower, um, uh, um, uh, on the lower um, uh, edge, of the, the lower limbus. And then as that oozes serum 24 seven onto the eye and protects the eye. And then as the ulcer heals underneath, it gradually lifts off up. It's a beautiful, and you can do that with, you don't need any eye kit at all. Do it with uh, any old pair of, of, sorry, I shouldn't say it. Of course, do it with a veterinary instrumentation. But if your veterinary instrumentation kit is in another practice and you're in a branch and you've got a dog with a melting ulcer, so what well, you just use any scissors, cut round the top, undermine it, pull it down and suture with, with simple interrupteds. Because then as it's simple interrupteds, then gradually as the ulcer heals, you get these little uh, um, like little fingers um, that attach to where you your suture was. But the rest eventually the cornea is beautifully healed underneath. So so a really nice thing to um to do. So so that um that, that works out really nice. Oh, Greg, I've just I've sort of seen you've asked, does the owner put something on the place where there's a skin? Honestly, in these spaniels, you don't need to do anything. It will be so much happier. They don't need anything. It, it, it scars up in a day or so, and then it will granulate beautifully over two or three weeks. And it really, really does, does really nicely from that, that perspective. Um, <laughs> so the diamond bear, as I say, you just have this diamond bear on this little, um, let me go back, sorry, look again. Sorry, I didn't only just saw that. So the, oh, where was the, 
Oh, sorry, here we go. So the diamond, oh, okay. So the diamond bear, the diamond bear, you've got, you can get, you get this little dremel with a diamond bear on the end, and you just rub uh, with the animal, with a local anesthetic in, just rub it over the surface of the eye as the dremel is turning it, and it works absolutely, absolutely perfectly. It does really, really well. Really nice thing to, to do uh, the, the uh, diamond bear with. So, so I should do some little videos, shouldn't I, of these some things? one day so so um oh yeah thank you nigel about uh, cat ulcers yeah honestly there is another there's another whole evening to be done about about things like that um yeah uh i think we I don't think we've got enough time tonight to talk about flu bankins as the fam cyclovir is an eighth of 125 milligram capsule and uh, sorry tablets of fam cyclovir daily it works brilliantly with kittens with with cat flu so so that's right Liam hi Liam hi good to see you um um uh what um what do you do with the photograph the thing about the photograph is that actually it it uh it lifts up as the ulcer heals underneath you don't need to cut it it naturally lifts off so um so yeah so so that's that's absolutely fine um uh, so yeah, no no problem with that at all. That really works works well. And yeah, so so the, as Anna says, the hood graft retracts back come to the normal position. It may take a month to do as the sutures eventually dissolve, and that's why they use maybe four, maybe five naught vicral as the sutures. The six naught dissolves a bit too quickly so five knot maybe even four knot uh, stays there and then eventually um it uh, and then as you say yeah philippa yeah uh, so i would i would leave it there until the, leave the graft on until it heals underneath you don't need to remove the sutures it's 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 absolutely fine it works really well and then oh yeah so uh um what yeah so I, I've had one case with some really nasty, aggressive owners. It was always, always going to be that, where the conjunctiva didn't, didn't uh, come off the ulcer. And then they persuaded me that I, I said, look, if it hasn't come off, it's not meant to. And they, they, they then persuaded me to... to undo the sutures and take it off and then it was it, it, it for some reason it hadn't healed underneath and and uh it all went horribly wrong that's one in probably 120 i suppose that have done that so so oh yeah so louis that's a very good question would i use a hood graft also for non-melting ulcers i am i've been so happy with it i am starting to do that and I think with internet ulcers like the box ulcers, I honestly feel that 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 just doing a a, a diamond bear works for you. Or the one thing we haven't talked about is phenol, which is fantastic. Phenol always works in 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 ulcers. You just have to be a bit careful about about using it from a from a health and safety perspective. Um. So yeah. So you so Richard. So I. I haven't done a pedicle graft for ages because the hood graft then comes comes off. If there's still something that needs it, it leaves a little pedicle there. So so and then yeah, Scott, I'm using. Would you believe? Uh, so actually, probably five naught vicral to to suture the graft in. Um. So um. Oh yeah, Ishma. Um. Surgical people are calling those abscesses. I you can cut them out, but this, um that may be, dare I say, the sort of thing to um, to to refer or to really hit them hard with something like exosin as a fluoroquinolone that can work really really well from that that perspective. Great questions, guys. Really good. Do I dip? Oh, Rita, yes. Do I dip bride or grid keratotomy cat ulcers? No. So. So we've always been told that cat ulcers, if you do a grid on them, they end up being a um, uh, corneal sequestrum. And so now people are starting to do diamond bears on them. 
I'm still a bit nervous about doing that because I worry that actually they may may turn into a corneal sequestrum after I've done after I've done that. But gosh, again, that is um, yeah. So Paul, you're so right. Phenol only in box ulcers and not in deep ulcers. And actually, a diamond burr only in superficial ulcers and not in deep ulcers. The only things are. Uh, the only things about uh, um, uh, the phenol and the diamond berm and all these sort of things that are agreed are all for non-healing ulcers where the problem is that the, the epithelium isn't sticking down, as we can see on that on that picture there. Top, oh, yeah, so a good one. So actually, what I would do is on the hood graft, you, if the dog is difficult to put the drops in, you can give it systemic antibiotics because it'll all be coming out of the serum. But actually, if you if you bung a couple of drops in, you're not you you're because you're doing individual sutures. Actually, it's enough for the for the drop to run under the under the hood graft. It's not absolutely so hard baked on as it were that and that. That you can't do that. So that's why I would I would I put a cup. And normally I put one drop in an eye because anything more just goes down the uh, down the tear duct. But I would normally put two drops in, uh, and I'd always do give some antibiotics. Or as I say, yeah, maybe maybe you could give it systemic antibiotics if they didn't want to worry about the the rest of the animal. So so where are we? So yeah, melting ulcers. As I say, I would now do. The hood graft and uh, it worked. It's worked really, really, really well. So, so it worked out very well. Oh, what are you going to do with these? Honestly, guys. Well, I have. I must admit, refer this because if you're going to do a corneoconjunctival transposition graft, unless you're really brilliant, um, uh, um, uh, I, um, I would, um, uh, um. Uh, what I would do actually is a third eyelid flap, as I'll talk about in a moment or two. Um, and actually, uh, Sinia, I mean, you could do a third eyelid flap over an indolent ulcer, and they work quite well as well. Um, um, so, oh yeah. So the thing is, when you've got something like a, a perforated corneal ulcer, oh, um, I have done hood grafts on those. And they really work really well. And they're there, easy to use. You don't need amniotic membrane or anything like that. I mean, I know people have tried lots of things. And when there are loads of different things people have used, you know, none of them really work well. So I must admit, the hood graph seen, has worked really well. I had two last week that came from the RSPCA where somebody had said they would charge a thousand pounds to nucleate the eye. And I put a hood graft up for 50 and 50 quid for the anesthetic from darling Jennifer in Bulldog. And then, and for 100 quid, we put this, we put a hood graft over and it's worked in, in both of them last week. So, so I think that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, don't start with an FELV positive cat. It's a bit of a nightmare. So, so, mm, trickiness, that might have been a reason for me. So, in these ones, honestly, I know it looks ghastly, but Actually, if you've got an animal where the key thing is protecting the eye, if you then did a third eyelid flap, so and this, so I would put a suture through the upper eyelid, then then through the from the front of the third eyelid, going under the the T of the cartilage, up back, and then through a bit of drip tubing, and it they work brilliantly. We've got a student. This year, doing a project looking at third eyelid flaps. So, if you've got a, um, uh, uh, if you've got a third eyelid, um, uh, uh, if you've got a third eyelid, if you do third eyelid flap, do get in touch with me uh, because I'd love to to include those in our in our study. If we put in, no, there is no good paper on third eyelid flaps. People say, oh, don't do it because you can't see the eye underneath. As I say, as a vet. The moment that dog walks out of your consulting room, pays and goes out the front door, you can't see the ulcer, the, the, the eye. So I would say, I think third eye, in fact, they work brilliantly. So really worth worth doing. So so uh, um, so I think that, that I'm just, what I'm going to do on here, I'm just going to write my, um, 
my email. Uh, David. Yes. If if you're happy to share your contact details, I yeah. can add those into my oh, follow-up yeah. emails. So so um so yeah so but um but because we've only got a minute or two left, so so, so do do have a look at the Instagram bow tie there and and just get in touch with me with any cross questions you've got really on that on the email, and I'll be only too happy to to deal with you. So lastly, what do you do with it? Should you? send the cataract for, for assessment for cataract surgery. So this dog on the on the left here has a diabetic cataract. Actually already uh, it's got it's sucked in so much water you can see what we call these water clefts here in the in the in the lens there. And that's look it's it's um it's iris is really dull dark homogeneous brown this is classic lens induced uveitis as the air lens expands little micro fractures in the capsule have let some soluble lens material out and the eye goes flip where have you come from let's mount an immune response against you and then the wonderful immune response in the eye calms down the the immune response but still it's there in case something else happens in case somebody opens the eye puts a ready great probe in and starts blasting water at it so my worry is that cataract surgery and in the in the best hands has an 80 percent success rate um and lots of the animals that i see have severe glaucoma or or uveitis afterwards so i'm not really that keen on cataract surgery i think if you do it you really have to be careful that you choose exactly the right animals for it would you choose these animals for it this dog has widely dilated pupils even though it's bright light around that's as the as the, the animal on the other side and actually shine light in there's no pupil of confliction if you do that you know you'll send these people off for an expensive assessment when they say sorry your dog's got progressive retinal atrophy and there's nothing that we can do um to uh to solve its vision so so sorry i've i've realized i've realized that i've i've um uh i've ended on a rather a, a negative note saying there's something but actually again these animals are delight they're fine they're not they've not got a problem and um, and so um i hope that at least tonight we've we've entertained you and showed you showed you some stuff that you can do uh in in practice and uh, and get in, keep in touch um thank you and if you've got any questions do do ask away there are a few more questions in the q a if you just yeah, want to have a quick look through yeah those. i will for sure we thank have you. we have overrun by nearly half an hour i know i know but you should we, but honestly rachel you should have if you talk to anybody if you talk to my children you should have ask me a question and i'll just keep on talking so no it's oh, brilliant yeah. and the so, audience miriam miriam you're what a good why when why when do you use a content lens? You know, i don't use content lenses because i find they drop out it's so embarrassing when they drop out of the dog before the people have paid that really is a bit embarrassing so so i generally don't use them some people do and i know so so what i would use actually is not dare i say if there are people from veterinary, veterinary speciality products are watching this, i don't use dog contact lenses i use human um, uh, single use contact lenses and that's these they they could work well but generally i must admit i don't i don't do that and then as i say yeah uh Sydney, so plate, i really haven't looked at plate rich plasma much at all um for that so um so and then richard says do i release the, just the upper i, I must admit uh, these I used to do all the way round kind of time and then stitch them together in the middle. It's always then if you've got a little stitch that works its way under, you can cause a corneal stitch just by the stitching middle. So then I stitch, put the stitch at the bottom, and then that means there's a bit of tension that lifts lifts it off. Um, uh, um, so I would do a hood graft where there's a melting ulcer that needs serum on the time if you've got something like a pug that's just got an exposed surface ulcer and it's not going to burst tomorrow and then i'd put a third eyelid flap 
uh, up on it. So that's the answer that more over the difference between a hood and a, a flat. So and um, yeah, um, so um, so yeah, Chris says you can't see the eye under the hood graphs either. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's just basically the trouble with the third line flap is you can all do them. So if I built my fifteen million pound hospital, I'm not going to want you to be able to do them. I, so oh. So we've got a moment to do tetracaine as a local anaesthetic, and then just metacam as an analgesic is the thing that I that I use. Oh, Lewis, thank you for thank you for your thanks for the and uh, yeah, enjoy. So yeah, so as I say, we I put my I put my p my email on the on the question and answer, but uh, but I'm sure that Rachel will give give it give it out. Um, yeah, if you're... and also, and also, come and see, come and see a week's worth of EMS with me. That'd be lovely. Well, not all of you at once, three hundred and fifty, but 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 do do that. Be lovely. Thank you very much indeed. I'm glad you've enjoyed it, David. That's been a massively informative and entertaining webinar. It really has, and um, it's definitely the first time leg waxing has been uh, spoken <laughs> about in one of my webinars. Um, to our audience, those of you who are remaining, and actually it's the majority of you, even though we've run over by half an hour, so thank you for sticking with us. Um, so many questions, such an engaged audience, which is brilliant. Um, David is going to be helping me create a, a surgery guide um, for on ophthalmic surgery. That's one of our projects for the remainder of the year. Um, if you guys can stay online and just complete a short survey that's going to pop up on your screen when I press um, when I when I finish the webinar, you've got the option to say that you'd like to receive that surgery guide when it's complete. All the questions that have been asked on the webinar tonight, um, we're going to go through those. We'll incorporate those. Probably have a, a frequently asked questions section at the end of that surgery guide. So. Um, the fact that you've been so engaged is brilliant and it's going to help me to develop some new educational materials so really super grateful for that um our next webinar is coming hot on the heels of this one we normally do one every two months our next webinar is actually in two weeks time on the 11th of july um there will be a link for you to sign up to that in the uh email that you'll get with the recording uh, for this webinar uh, the next one is on um monitoring of vital signs in um um, veterinary anaesthesia so hopefully we'll see loads of you there David it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for your time this evening and to our audience again thank you for being brilliant and sticking with us and being yeah. so engaged thank you I'm going to press really I'm going to press end uh David's going to go well I'm going to go and have a glass of wine I don't know what David's going to do um thank you very much everyone David thank you again thank see you, you soon, soon. Bye -bye. thank you everyone Bye bye, bye.